Hi all, we're going to have a look now at my game from round two of the exciting Bionic Congress I played in on the weekend. In this game I won against Philip Bonifont. I was playing black and I played my favourite King's Engine defence. Unfortunately um, he played a system which I do still kind of fear. So it's after this mainline continuation. He played the bayonet attack with b4 which there have been some other videos I've done on this. So far this season I've been very lucky against this system. Uh, I seem to have won every single game so far against it, but uh, the season before I was doing very badly against it, so maybe it's just increased insights and trying to look at the losses to see where I was going wrong. One of the key moves for Black, I believe, um, which is almost mandatory, is to play knight h5. So this bishop is being potentially exposed um, on the diagonal, um, which White's now weakened with this b4 move, weakening that diagonal. So knight f4s are now possible, uh, where this bishop would be unleashed. It seems to be quite a logical move. After rook e1, I played knight f4, and now Philip played bishop f1. So here, my preferred plan is not f5, which would allow knight g5 and knight e6 with a, a form pawn, and White can often just sacrifice a pawn to get a strong light squared attack. My preferred plan is actually to play h6, a bit slow perhaps, but if I can get in g5, I'll have a nice position, reminiscent of some games of John Nunn playing the King's Engine. And maybe this knight can swing in uh, to g6 and then f5, and maybe even a, a knight sacrifice on f4 could happen later. So I like this way of playing the position. Philip plays an immediate bishop takes f4 now. So unleashing my bishop a bit on this diagonal. After rook c1 protecting that knight now, which, which is on pre, I played g5. And now he took the opportunity, before I've got the chance to play knight g6, he played e5. Obviously I don't want to give up my precious king's engine bishop. So I didn't do d takes, allowing knight takes. That, that would be very awkward for me. So these, these pawns would be very dangerous later. Instead I just played knight g6, trying to establish a stronghold on the e5 square. I was half expecting actually him to play e6 here which according to Ribka gives a slight advantage to white, but it's not totally critical, um, thankfully. In fact, he played what Ribka thinks after the depth 11 to be the stronger move. He played takes on d6, and after cd, actually he played a very interesting move now, knight e f sorry, rook, queen d3, almost provoking me to play g4 and knight e5. I didn't play g4 immediately. Let's have a quick look. G4 knight d2, let's say knight e5, white has now queen e4, this is what I thought during the game, and I thought my f pawn would be a, a liability here, but apparently, according to Ribica, queen g5 and black has a slight advantage, so maybe this is playable as well, I'm threatening now bishop f5, so this is okay for black, what I did was more cautious, I played a5, with the idea of a trying to get some a file pressure with say rook a3's coming in if he allowed me say a3 to take on b4 and then rook a3 but the way he played it b5 his potential for c5 has been neutralized now especially after my my next continuation I play a4 first because I don't want him to play a4 blocking in my queen from the a5 square and after queen c c2 I played g4 because his last move, queen c2, it does mean that now g4, the knight has to retreat back. And now I've got this comfortable diagonal with my queen to come to b6. But first I play g3. And after knight f3, now I play queen b6. So I'm not that bothered about the queen not coming to the king side. Um, I'm more interested in this pin on this diagonal and, and the potential maybe to get in bishop d4s if this knight was never there. After knight d1, he seemed to be becoming very passive, but I didn't want this potential for c5 as a disruptive um, move, so I played queen c5, blockading that c-pawn. And after bishop d3, I played knight e5 now, pursuing this dark square strategy. After knight e5, bishop e5, king h1, I suddenly realised perhaps I'm a bit in danger here of queen e2 and queen h5. I didn't want this, so I tried to seal up this queen route into my position with bishop g4, provoking f3. And after bishop c8, 
Now queen d2, he's fretting hg and then the queen comes, you know, taking on h6. So I take on h2, and after queen f2, he has um, survived the attack. And although he's done that, I can still I can still have this nice dark squared bishop. So I wasn't too concerned about this ending. And with b6, I'm still locking in this c-pawn. So there isn't an immediate, you know, pawn structural um, breakthrough for white. After king takes h2, I play now a3. Because this pawn, I can always support it with bishop b2 later. After rook b1, I find a nice plan now. I, I play f5 with the idea of marching my king to f6 and potentially doubling up rooks on the g2 f pawn. So the rooks will be very flexible with rook a7s and rook f7s. So they could either um, double on the g file or protect this pawn as, as the game went. He gangs up on my pawn now with these uh, manoeuvres with his knight c3 to b1 to try and gang up on the a3 pawn. I didn't want to um, commit to a pawn sacrifice immediately so I actually played rook f a7 here. And after rook d1, bishop b2, knight c3, there was a bit of manoeuvring now by me. I, it was infiltrating though with rook e7 with um, now rook e3 as an infiltration move so I didn't want to accept the draw for he had made um, around this time. So I thought I was getting a little bit of pressure here. So this pawn was a liability though. It wasn't there by the way because uh, bishop e5 and if g3 then take on f4 takes and then rook takes f3. But now it was so I have to protect it. After king f2 um, I play rook e8 because I don't want him playing stuff like knight takes f4, king f4 and g3 check embarrassingly winning my rook. So I have to be careful. Now here bishop d4 check, and now bishop e3. The bishop's quite dangerous in this ending. Now rook a7, so I've got this plan again to sort of attack on the g2 um, pawn. So my king uh, reroutes to f6 now, and now rook g8. But he's forcing my hand with um, an exchange sack now because he's leveraging this um, rook attacking the bishop. So I have to play this exchange sacrifice. I can't play fg because rook takes e3. So I play the exchange sack. And I assess the compensation is very good for me. Because in this position, after bishop c5, how can white break through um, into my position? I think I can only improve this position. I have a passed h-pawn here. This bishop has the potential to come later to h5 to attack that vulnerable f3 pawn. And my king is more aggressive than white if my rook can get onto the seventh rank and tie his king down. So this occurred now. You can see that black's able to just improve the position. So first, marching the pawn down. The second plan, this bishop to h5. And now the third plan was aggressively getting the rook on the seventh rank and now infiltrating with the king. So the pressure for the exchange sacrifice is now enormous. And it's becoming so critical that in this position actually he, he resigned. He had had enough. So, I was very pleased with this second round victory. It was actually, so I was actually on two out of two after this win. Quite elated uh, to win with my favourite King's Engine. So let's have a quick overview and summary of what happens here. This was a bayonet King's Engine defence. And I pursued a dark square strategy, initiated with knight h5. So, with knight f4. Now, I didn't want this um, knight g5 to e6 variation. I wanted instead... Um, to, to play g5 here, but he took immediately, which is a critical test, and now this is another critical test with an immediate e5, otherwise I'll be quite comfortable with knight g6, with a blockade and occupation of the e5 pawn, e5 square. So e5, knight g6, I'm still okay here. After taking, queen d3, perhaps this is a bit of a, a controversial move, it allowed me to inc intensify the pressure on the dark squares, which I did, even doing this g3 move, which seems a bit risky, but perhaps, you know, it's, it's a way of attacking. Queen c5 blockades the c, c5 possibilities. And here, I didn't mind the exchange of knights, or even going into this ending now, because the dark square bishop's pressure persists. It gave me flexibility now to have this plan to get the, the king to f6, and where my rooks can start pressurizing on this semi-open g file. So the doubling up of rooks on the g-file is what later proved decisive. 
to intensify the pressure on White's position. So you see the, the Rooks versus Silicy here to come to the G line. And this exchange sacrifice is necessary, otherwise I'm always going to be defending against this pawn on a3. But there's no, there's no breaking in points in my position. So these bishops are now very, very dangerous and able to improve um, their placement with white being um, just in a very passive position without a plan really, a uh, constructive plan available. So you can only watch as I improve my position until it becomes completely critical. So he was not only losing the position, but that's a lose on time as well. So um, I hope you enjoyed that game and there's something instructive in it for you. Please leave any comments on YouTube. Thanks very much.